Good day to you and welcome wherever this message finds you. For me, you found me in my home office, albeit a little changed and a little modified from the way it normally looks. But we are glad at First Presbyterian Church of Taylorville, Illinois, to bring you this service of worship that can find you through the blessings and benefits of technology, where during a time, rather, when we cannot be together. We are glad you have found us, and we invite you uh, to share however you found us uh, with anyone you think would find a word of hope, a word of comfort, or a time of worship and praise of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Please feel free to share us far and wide. But as we begin our time together, as we normally do when we are gathered together in our sanctuary, let us begin the remainder of our time by turning our hearts and our minds to our God in prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, we give you thanks that no building can house you fully and no place of worship can contain your majesty. Teach us by our deeds of peace and justice and joyful celebration to set up places of worship in the world wherever we are, so that when some other soul comes across them, they will see that you are indeed present everywhere. Amen. In times of security and in time of uncertainty, O oh Lord, you hear our prayers. Through the abundance of your steadfast love, you have gathered us in our own homes and places, and we find you have already gathered us in your presence. In the holiness of your presence, we bow down to worship and adore you. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in Jesus will never die. Friends, one of the interesting blessings, if you will, that come of this time is getting to peek behind the scenes, as it were, a little bit. You may not recognize this bowl. You may think this looks like just a common, ordinary bowl, a common vessel. But actually, this is the plastic bowl 
that normally sits within the wooden baptismal font in our sanctuary. Countless people, ordinary vessels themselves, young and old, have come through the waters of baptism in this common vessel and have been named and claimed as God's own beloved for many, many years. Friends, during this time through our Lenten journey, even though we are separated, we give thanks and remember that we too, through faith in Christ alone, have been named and claimed in these waters. Let us now remember our baptisms. Let us now recommit to live our lives for God alone, no matter the cost, no matter the circumstances. Amen and amen. Even in faithfulness, God loves us still and waits in mercy to forgive. Trusting in the Spirit of God, let us confess our sin. Holy God, you promise us a life full of blessing, but we do not always believe. You incite us to hope, but we fall back into fear. You urge us to give freely, but we cling to what we have. You call us to watch at all times for you, but we grow lazy and self-absorbed. Forgive us. Increase our hope, enlarge our hearts, and keep us alert to the wonders you work in the world every day. In the hope of Jesus, our resurrection and life, we pray. Amen. O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. If Jesus Christ dwells in you, the Spirit of God will be your life, and the grace of God will be your righteousness. And if the Holy Spirit dwells in you, then God, who raised Jesus from the dead, will also give life to your mortal bodies. Friends, this is the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Jesus was his lonesome valley. He had to walk it by himself. Oh, nobody else could walk it for him. He had to walk it by himself. Jesus prayed for disciples. He made a hope for you and me. Oh, nobody else could bear such sorrow. He made a hope for you and me. Jesus died on Calvary's mountain. He died alone for you and me. Oh, nobody else could die for sinners. He had to die for you and me. Jesus rose from death's dark prison. He lives a plan for you. He is a lot to set us free. Now is the time ordinarily in our service where we would invite the children who are gathered with us together in our sanctuary to come on down. But now we are doing, as we are doing virtual church, uh, we Invite virtually all the children who are watching or who may be present with you to come gather around the screen. Uh, and as we did last week, this is also very appropriate for the big kids among us too, if you'd like to join us. Well, we saw last week when we were talking about the 23rd Psalm, we talked about how no matter what happens in life, even when scary things happen in life, we can know and we can take comfort that God is always with us. 
But how do we know God is with us? I mean, I'm not in my office at church. I'm at my office at home. I mean, it looks a little bit like my office. Um, you know, there's some things. I've got some of my books from my office here. Um, I've even got uh, this Jesus with me uh, here sitting on my shelf. Or for those of you who have seen my desk uh, back at the office, I even have the bobblehead Jesus, but that's not really what we mean when we say Jesus is with us no matter what, is it? It really isn't. But there are times when things don't go right, things don't go the way we wish they would. I'm sure you don't have to think very hard about a time in your own life where things didn't work out the way you had planned or the way you had hoped for. Sometimes we're upset, sometimes we're sad, maybe even we cry or get angry. But at other times, some, for some reason, and we don't always know why, we, we sometimes feel a sense of peace or calm or comfort. Maybe we talk to a parent or to our siblings or to a good friend, and what they say to us during those times makes us feel a little bit better. Or... We read a good book, or we listen to music or a song. You know, I think these are all ways that God uses to speak to us. Sometimes God speaks to us directly. Certainly when we read the Bible, we, we say that is God's word to us. And it is. But there are also times where God speaks through the voices of other people, of musicians. Uh, sometimes it's family, sometimes it's friends, sometimes it's a person we never know, but we hear something that we need to hear that tells us it's going to be okay, that we're going to get through things, that no matter how upset or disappointed or hurt we might be, it's not going to be like this or feel like this forever. I think those are really the ways, much more than a doll or a bobblehead, for us to remember that God is always with us, no matter what. Well, if you would, uh, let us end our time together this week by going, as we always do, to God in prayer. So I invite you, as you're able, uh, to bow your heads and let us say a prayer. Dear God, we give you thanks that you are always with us no matter what, in good times and in bad times, you are always with us. You always love us and you always care for us. Thank you that you are always with us. And whenever we are scared, afraid or upset, or even when we're feeling good, let us know you're always with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the moments ahead, we will now hear the word of God. But first, let us bow our heads in prayer. Speak to us, O Lord, your saving word. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and feed us with the bread of life. Amen. Our Old Testament reading today is taken from the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel 37, verses 1 through 14. I, as the liturgist, will read for you verses 1 through 5, and then as our people, please join in verses 6 through 11. The Valley of Dry Bones The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of God, can these bones live? And I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones, and say to them, O oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones. Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. 
And I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord, when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Our gospel reading for this time together is from the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verses 1 through 45. I will be reading from the New Revised Standard Version translation. Listen again for God's word. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill, so the sister sent a message to Jesus. Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha, and her sister, and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and you are going there again? Jesus answered, are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble, because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble, because the light is not in them. After saying this, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us go also, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, 
the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were there with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus! Come out! The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him, and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary, and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Although the story is much more fitting for Christmas, most of us know the story and the wicked plot of the Grinch. There he is up on Mount Crumpet, hating the Who's in Whoville and everything about Christmas. He doesn't like a thing about it and just can't stand it, so he resolves he will finally put a stop to this. With his faithful but perhaps mistreated dog Max, the Grinch comes and takes everything, absolutely everything there is down in Whoville, and he does it to stop Christmas from coming. Except, of course, he doesn't. We know the story, right? He tried, but he couldn't. The Who's already knew why he couldn't do it. They knew what Christmas was all about. It's not about decorations or presents. It's not about feasts. It's not about lights or trees or any of the other things that we commonly associate with Christmas. It's about something more, something deeper, more profound, something that cannot be stopped, something that can't be taken away. And because it couldn't be stopped, because it came anyway, that is, after all, why the Grinch's heart is said to have grown three sizes that day, a full size more than it was shrunken in from normal. Fans of the fantasy epic Game of Thrones are no doubt familiar with the phrase, Winter is coming. These are not just the words of House Stark, it is a reality, a reality that is coming, and no one and nothing can do anything to stop it. All you can do is be prepared as best you can when it finally arrives. As a friend of mine often says about things that are inevitable, accept it, embrace it, move on. Our Lenten journey has been anything but typical up to this point. In the days and weeks to come, it's not going to get any more normal. But you know, the one thing that will not change, cannot change, is our destination. Nothing can stop that. We are, make no mistake, on our way to the cross. We enter during this Lenten journey a time of 
preparation, a time of going without, maybe even a time of suffering where we reflect in our own difficulties or hardships as we observe Lenten disciplines, the sufferings of Christ, either by going without certain things or taking up other certain practices. We find the awesome price in this of God's solidarity with humans and the great cost of our disobedience, even our indifference and ingratitude. Even more, after the cross is that lonely, solitary day that is called Holy Saturday, a day where Jesus was separated even from the presence of God the Father, a day where we reflect even on our own sense of separation and alienation from God. But that's not it. That's not the final destination. We don't go just that far to only go just that far. No, in fact, the last word, maybe the most critical word, it comes to us in this reading from John's Gospel. More than the Grinch not stealing Christmas, more than the inevitability that winter is coming, at least for Game of Thrones, it shows us that Easter is coming. Easter is coming no matter what. Two weeks. Two weeks and it will be here. April 12th will not change. That will still be Easter, even if everything else in our lives remains changed as it is now. Even if we do not have the ability to gather as we have year after year after year to celebrate that beautiful morning, nothing can stop Easter. Not sin, not death, not evil, not hate, not political expediency, not unbelief, not religious monotony, not pandemics, not social distancing, not even our inability to gather in that sacred worshiping space of our sanctuary. The reality of Easter is that God's gift of life, God's gift of new life for us is so much greater than all of these other things. In John chapter 11, words we heard all but a few verses of, the reality of new life, of Jesus's ability to give us, to grant to us that new life, it is on full, complete, and impossible to miss display. Like God breathing life, inspiring, as it were, that valley of dry bones. Jesus, just as Jesus himself will soon experience when he walks breathing out of that tomb. Here it is. New life. Something that is coming. Something uplifting. Something life-changing. Something that nothing that seeks to stop it will be able to stop it in these dark and difficult and challenging days. We need a glimpse of Easter. We need a taste of what is going to come, a taste of this new thing that God is doing. We need a word of hope. And this text, this story, the raising of Lazarus, so rich in details and imagery, it is literally dripping with that hope for us. But a word of caution, a text that is so big, so deep, so rich, so over the top in many ways. We, we could likely hear 50 sermons on all of these words and just still barely scratch the surface. These words today can barely do it justice. Just last week in my own daily devotions, the person who wrote uh, one of those devotions took an entire week where we broke this chapter down bit by bit by bit. We read, we prayed over, we pondered upon, we reflected about what was going on in the story and what God was saying to us through it. Now that many of us have literally nothing but time on our own hands, I invite you to do the same. Do it with yourself or with a loved one or with your family. Join up with somebody online or on the phone. Read these words. Hear this story. Let God speak to you a new word about new life in them in these days and weeks to come. Picture in your own mind's eye this scene and scope. Put yourself as if you were there in Bethany that day long ago. See what the depth of belief 
and new life is all about. In John, make no mistake, belief is always written as a verb, never as a noun. Belief is not an idea or a thought or some abstract concept that we come up with. Belief is an action. It is something that when we engage in belief, we are called to respond. We are called to do something. Belief requires something of us. But we'll get to exactly what that might be in just a moment. But for now, in light of this reading, in light of Lazarus's life, Recognize and claim for yourself this day the reality that we are a people through our faith that are called to live differently. Not just as we've lived differently these past few days and weeks, but always we are called to be a different kind of person. We don't live as the world does. After all, a people of faith are to be a people, first and foremost, of hope. Martha and her sister Mary they send word in hope to Jesus, the one you love. Our brother is ill. Please come. He needs you. For his own reasons, though, Jesus doesn't come. He does not arrive until Lazarus has been entombed for four entire days, quite dead, separated as much as possible from any semblance of life. Yet in their encounters, they come. Martha meets him at the edge of town. Mary eventually comes. They say the same thing. Lord, if you had been here, surely he would not have died. Martha goes on to say, yet even now, anything you ask, I know God will hear and grant you. In these encounters, they come, they speak, they profess their belief. They confess at least Martha does, exactly who Jesus is. They've never doubted, not even for a moment, of Jesus' ability to save their brother, only that he has seemingly come too late. But with God, we know. We know as people of hope that all things are possible. But all things happen only in God's perfect time. We're not just a people of hope. We are a people who are empowered. We are inspired breath, the Spirit in us, filled with God's Spirit to look beyond present circumstances. Like somebody who restores old houses or antique cars, in faith, we have the ability to see beyond what is, what passes for our present circumstances. We can see things as they should be, as they might be, as they could be again. We are a people who have experienced new life, even now, in our own life here today. We are the ones, because of that, that are called to proclaim it, to share it, and to live it out in the world. God has left all of us changed, because we've encountered the presence of the living God. There's no alternative for that. When we step on holy ground, when we come into the presence of the divine, we cannot be changed. Literally, all those things that are unnecessary, that are not part of the beautiful created being that God made us to be, literally, they melt away in God's presence. The great artist Michelangelo once said of sculpting, something he was uniquely gifted at, the sculpting, sculpting was an easy form of art because in each block of marble that he encountered, there was a beautiful image in it. His only job was to take away all of those things that were obscuring it. In much the same way, <coughs> in much the same way, that is exactly what God is doing with us, taking away those things that we do not need. We think we need them. But, they, but we don't. God takes them away. God melts them away. And we see not the things we need, but the only one we actually need. Our reading today is not just about the power of Jesus to raise somebody to life. That's a simple reading. That's a simple claim. That's a surface thing here. It's low-hanging fruit. No, this is about Jesus' ability to give a new life. More than just a restoration of physical life, Lazarus lived a new life. A life that threatened the status quo in the world. One that saw him for the rest of his life. 
as a marked man because he had a new life, a changed life. That is what Jesus has come for. And that is what we receive in faith, a new life. Resurrection. Resurrection, what Jesus claims as his identity. Resurrection is not a day that is going to come far in the future on the last day only. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life, Jesus says. Jesus is our new life. In Jesus, the future hope of eternal life with God has been brought into the present and made new today and every day. Have you ever noticed, or maybe you have heard from others, that the point of faith is to get out of this world? That we can't wait, that we, we need to escape. This world is evil, it has fallen, it is damaged, and boy, we have such a great place we are going to go to. Many will even claim that very idea is in the Bible. But it's not there. It isn't. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. God came to be with us here in this world, in this life here on earth. Even in the revelation, the revelation that John received, even as the new heavens are created, where is it located? Behold, I looked, and the new heaven and the new Jerusalem descending here on earth. This is not about escaping the earth or this ordinary life. This is about God coming and redeeming and reclaiming and reconstituting this earth and our lives into new life now. And that is our purpose. That is the work of belief, the work of faith, to make that a reality, to make God's kingdom as in heaven, so on earth. Our faith is not some eternal safety net or escape plan. This is a full-size, all-encompassing God reclamation plan. Our hope, our normal, our equilibrium in life is not in what is, but rather who is. John chapter 10, the chapter right before, which the one we just heard, Jesus claims another identity. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, my sheep know me. When I speak, they know my voice. Here we see that same shepherd calling one of his sheep in Lazarus. And that sheep knows his voice and obeys. In a few chapters to come, that good shepherd that lays down his life for the sheep will indeed be called and will indeed, of his own volition, lay down his life for his sheep. Yet this passage, more than just raising Lazarus, more than comforting grieving sisters, this is Jesus' embrace. God's embrace of us, of life, of this world, no matter the circumstances. This is Jesus' Jesus's and God's embrace, not rejection, of all things human. This is God daring to enter into the nitty-gritty, the unseemly, the smelly, the decay, the rot, the stench, the despair, and death of life, to be with us in a way that not even any of those things, not even death itself, can stop. That is our word of hope. God can't be stopped. God is coming. There's nothing we can do about it. Accept it, embrace it, move on, but move on in faith. God knows our lot because God has lived it and lives it with us and always has, always will. This is a very present, fully, fully God, but fully human God. Reverend Richard Halverson was a Presbyterian minister. He was also the chaplain of the United States Senate from 1981 to 1994, just a year before his passing away. As we begin to draw our time in God's Word to a close this week, we know that we never really close our time in God's Word except when we walk away from it, and I hope you won't do that with these words of God this week. But as we close this portion of our time together, 
here's some words that have come from him, words of a benediction he has spoken that has now been named and called the Halverson Benediction. They remind us of the power and reality of a God who chose being with us over the safety and comfort of keeping us at arm's length. Think about that. Think about that in these days. While we are called, and rightly so, to observe social distancing, to, as much as we are able to, to be six feet away from, and from others as much as possible, as much as we do this, not only as an act of love and commitment to the health and well-being of the most vulnerable in our community, but also as an act of devotion to God, hear these words of a God who dares to come near to us. Hear these words that tell us that Christ is always with us wherever we are. These are the words of Reverend Halverson. You go nowhere by accident. Wherever you go, God is sending you there. Wherever you are, God has put you there. He has a purpose in your being there. Christ who indwells you has something he wants to do through you wherever you are. Believe this and go in his grace and love and power. Amen. These are great words of comfort. Words that remind us that the old life, the dead life, the religious life, the political life, the status quo life, the enslaved life, the sick and illness life, the idolatrous life, the egotistical life, the hungry life, the conflicted life. All of these lives we lead that we think are normal or just the way that this world is, they do not have, never have, never will. They do not have the final word. They do not have the final say. They are not all that is. These ways and more, they abhor this new way of life. They seek all means possible to stop it. But for those of us who believe, who possess belief. We are called to put it into action and respond. Those who bore witness that day to Lazarus walking forth from that tomb with his face covered, with his hands and feet bound by those linen strips that were still clinging to him, those signs of death that were still putting a claim on this one. Jesus said, take those things away take them away. We too are called to strip away all of the death and decay and all that which all that seeks to hold us and this world in the grip of death. We are a people who live differently. Let's do that. Another saying attributed to Halverson states in part, we have been the church gathered. Now we are the church dispersed. Remember, wherever you go, Christ goes. Whatever you do, Christ does. If someone asks you, what is your church like? Tell them, I am what my church is like. Friends, let us live lives worthy of those words. Ones that are worthy of that calling, even now in our present struggles, that we are called to respond to in faith. May God's grace, may God's mercy, may God's love and God's protection be upon you and all those you love this day and always. Let us live resurrection because resurrection is now in Jesus. Amen. Breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life
again turn our thoughts and our minds. Let us open our hearts together with one another as we give our prayers and concerns, as well as our joys and blessings, which are so important for us to remember at a time like this. And we give them all to our Lord in prayer. Some prayers to be aware of and to keep in mind and to add to your own concerns as well as your own joys and blessings. We pray for the continued changes to our everyday life and routine, and especially for those who it causes special pain or anxiety. We pray for the uncertain future, but we know beyond a shadow of a doubt, our certainty lies in that God is always with us, bringing us to new life. We pray for the disruption of routines, and especially for the loss of contact so many of us have had with other people. We pray for the acceleration of the spread and impact of this coronavirus. We pray that the actions we have been asked to take and sacrifices we have made would actually decrease that acceleration and spread. We pray for all who have been impacted, but especially those who have contracted this virus, both those who have fallen ill and recovered, and especially those who have contracted it and passed away. We also remember at this time how important it is to remain hopeful and focused, to look for the helpers, to pray for the helpers, our doctors and nurses, our hospital staff, uh, the staff in our doctor's offices, our EMTs, our police and fire personnel, all the people on the front lines doing everything they can to keep us safe. We pray for our government and for its leaders, for our president, Donald Trump, for Vice President Pence, for uh, the good counsel and direction that they've been getting from Dr. Anthony Fauci, and for all of the public health officials that are seeking to do and give us the best advice possible. We pray for them and all they are called to do on our behalf. And let us also remember to pray for an abiding sense that God is always with us. With these, let us add whatever remains on our hearts and minds as we turn all of these things over to God in prayer. As we pray, this is a responsive prayer. Whenever I say, Hear us, O Lord, you may respond, be gracious to us. Let us pray. We cry to you for help, O Lord, for you alone have the power to restore our lives. Hear us, O Lord, be gracious to us. Give bread to those who are hungry and drink to those who thirst. Hear us, O Lord, be gracious to us. Give life to those who are dying and grace to those who are sick with sin. Hear us, O Lord, be gracious to us. Give justice to those who are oppressed and peace to those who live in fear. Hear us, O God, be gracious to us. Give comfort to those who mourn and hope 
to those who despair. Hear us, O Lord. Be gracious to us. As you breathe life into dust and make dry bones dance with joy, give new life to this weary world through Jesus Christ our Savior, and in, in whose name and way we now pray together as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, as we did last week, as we prepare to come to our time of offering, we do invite you to remember the church and that we are very able and very willing to receive any gifts and tithes and offerings that you mail directly to the church. And that can be mailed to First Presbyterian Church, 116 East Franklin Street, Taylorville, Illinois, 62568. But also, this is a time and an opportunity for us to remember that as important as it is to give of our tithes and our offerings to the church, especially in a time such as this when bills will still come due and needs still need to be met, this is also a time for us to remember that offering is more than just what we do with our money. Money is very important, but what we do with our time and our skills and abilities is just as important. So as we come to this time of offering, let us remember that without the breath of God, we are nothing more than dry bones. And without the word of God, we are nothing more than dust. With gratitude, let us offer our lives to the Lord of all life. Let us give and give generously. Thank you. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son. I'm not sure about you, but it feels so uplifting to sing those words of the doxology. Even though we cannot be together, that is no reason that we cannot praise our God from whom indeed all blessings do flow. But now let us offer a prayer for the gifts and offerings, those we have sent in of a financial nature and those that we have received. And we do indeed thank all of you who have sent in an offering but also the offerings of our lives, our complete devotion to God and to neighbor. Let us pray God's blessing on this dedication. Thanks and praise to you, O God. By your grace, you bring the dead to life. Let us use the breath you have given us, the resurrection and the life that you are, to speak your truth and sing your glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
as our time comes to a close this day, hear these words, these final words as a benediction, truly the good word that they are, as well as a charge for how we live this day and always in our life. May the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the resurrection and the life, bless you and keep you in this life and indeed in the life to come. Know that your life is a gift of grace. Use it to give glory to God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessings be with you until we meet again.